A special thank you to the Archie Bray Foundation for sponsoring this episode of Tales of the Red Clay Rambler. The Bray Clay business is your best source for Bray epoxy, a two-part moldable epoxy intended for post-firing repairs. Working like clay, it's easy to shape, texture, fill gaps, and recreate missing parts. Bray epoxy is sold in tan, white, and black base colors, and we also have a nine color kit that will allow you to perfectly disguise your repair. To place your order, call us at 406-442-2521 or order online anytime at archiebrayclay.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 507 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Melanie Barnett. Her multimedia career spans design, studio art, and activism, focusing on the influence and aesthetics of the Black diaspora. In our interview, we talk about designing textiles and interiors, taking a sabbatical from that career to deep dive into ceramics, and founding the Black Artist and Designers Guild a collective aimed at building equitable and inclusive creative culture. Next week on the show, we're going to be broadcasting a panel discussion that Melanie moderated at this year's Sinsika conference, so this interview will help you to get to know her before we broadcast that. If you'd like to find out more information, you can go to melaniebarnett.com. Also, I wanted to mention that I have a new collection of work up at Clay Akar. I'm happy to be showing with them in their gallery in Iowa City, and you can check that collection out at clayacar.com. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. I hope I'm prepared. (laughs) (laughs) You're prepared. Funny enough, as I researched you, I realized you have done so many interviews. Like you almost have had press training just by the act of being interviewed over and over and over again. How do you feel about being in the public eye in terms of being a designer and artist, but also having to put it into words to journalists about what your life is? Yeah, I know. It's, uh, I, I find it, it's interesting because you, you know, I know the story, but it's quite interesting to hear how people translate my words. Right. And I think when you're writing a story, it's quite different than doing a podcast interview because, you know, you're hearing me and a journalist is interpreting what I said. And so sometimes it's interesting to read the stories and I'm like, oh, yeah, that really does sound like me. And then I'm like, oh, OK, I, I like how they embellish that. <laughs> but, you know, that you realize it's just like with art, when you make art. You don't have control on how people are going to interact with it once you put it out in the world. So like talking with journalists, they're also artists themselves. So they're, they're, their materials are words. So you know they're gonna use their um, creativity around crafting the story. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's interesting, it's fun, but it's also, it could be comical at times. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever have people just get it really wrong? I've had, I've had and, and it's actually the good thing about when they do get it wrong, if it's online, they can correct it. So, you know, but again, when it goes to print, it's a little different. But that's why a lot a lot of um, organizations, they kind of send you what they're thinking about before print. You know, you don't always get a preview, but, you know, it's nice when you do. Um, but, you know, we're, we're humans and we're going to make mistakes. So, I mean, it, it happens. And that's why I always tell people when it comes to press that, you know, don't believe everything you read. 
<laughs> it's, you know, just don't believe it all. Um, and then again, it's, it's a lot of perception of how things look and feel. Then, you, then we create stories around what we see in these in these articles, right? Oh, so and so. Oh, they they must be doing really well, and you know all these these stories that we create, but we truly don't know the truth. It's just like I think about myself, and I'm in the press. Um, I have struggles, just like everybody else, and people have no idea what it took to get to that article, right? They don't know that I probably the night before could have been in tears, you know, down and out from something, you know, maybe I had a, a win, a celebration for something else, but the emotions are constantly up and down, especially uh, being a creative person, being an entrepreneur, um, It there's a lot of pressure and then there's a lot that you are trying to, like I have my goals and I'm trying to live up to these goals while being public, you know, because people are actually watching me while I am progressing in my work. And so there's this expectation that, oh, she is going to, she what, what is she going to do next? Oh, I already know. You, you follow, so there's all these, a lot, there's a lot of stories that are happening in people's heads, which I know, which again, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Um, but then I also, I also take a step back and think, you know what, I have no idea what's going on in that person's life. I'm not in their shoes. You know, you, you read a story, it's only a partial truth. It's just like how I think about Instagram. It's a curation of half truths. So we don't know the full story. We're only accepting what people are sharing on that platform. This idea of the collection of truths is, is interesting because I, I feel like your work in the different facets from design to your ceramic work to your activism, it, it is an a expression of truth as you see it, but the outputs look different. Like your design work in rugs, I don't want to say there's um, – design has a certain sheen where ideas become refined to a point of clarity that sometimes I think in clay work they don't have to be. Like what we accept as being clear in the ceramic world is very different than if you're going to mass produce a rug that's going to go in the Marriott or, <laughs> you know, like one of your clients. So can you talk about clarity of idea? Do you think about this in any way, like that design has a different clarity of idea than your studio work in ceramics? Yeah, I think because I'm working, I'm designing projects for spaces, whether it's a home or a commercial space or a hotel, you want to think, uh, I'm thinking about the experience that I want people to have, you know, and so when you're thinking about an experience and that your work is going to e evoke a certain type of emotion, because, you know, people are either going to be like staying in a hotel um, and, you know, if you go into a hotel, walk into the lobby, the lobby is usually like, you know, it's really well dressed, as you would say, right? It's they put a lot of money into the lobbies because that's the first entry into the space. And then, you know, you, you the, the next experience is you go and check into your room and then you have access to these other public areas, whether it's the lounge, whether it's the restaurant and all of these spaces are about evoking a different experience, but under one theme. So usually there's a theme around these spaces, right? So I'm constantly thinking about how how do I create work that really addresses the theme, you know, but again, incorporating my creativity and my way of thinking. And so for me, that's where I draw, that's where the difference is. But the reality is the work also always stems from the same place, meaning that I'm always drawing or painting, doing my sketching, whether it's a rug or whether it's ceramics. Um, fig figure out how I'm going to use pattern to, to, you know, tell a language or have some type of experience or emotion for people to connect to, whether they understand the work or not. So I feel like the, this, the origin of how I'm creating is the same no matter what the object is. But I think when I'm designing, when I'm thinking about space and design, then that's where I'm really thinking about what kind of experience do I want people to engage in and feel and that's that's only that's a slight difference. But but, you know, Ben, to think about it, when it comes to like ceramic work, I am also thinking about space, too. But I'm thinking about it more in an exhibition type of way or um, a public area where it's not about where people will actually may live. They could because so it is the, the space, the idea around space gets expensive and it's not just, say, limited to a say a hotel. 
or a commercial space or someone's home. So I think that's the difference. Well, I realize I'm, we're jumping into the deep end. We Let's back up and talk about how you got to have a defined voice. And I heard in, an, in another interview, you talk about your experience at FIT where you were in school. You were getting assignments that were not including African design influences. And you realized as a student, like, wait, the school's not going to give me this. I have to take control of my own education and make all of my assignments about African influence. So can you talk about that period in life and in, in being within an educational program, but also kind of self-designing so that it met your needs as an artist at that point? Yeah, well, I think I'll go back to high school when I had my awakening around who I am as a Black woman, you know, thinking about Black culture and, and the expansiveness of, of the culture and not knowing enough about it. After reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, that like sparked my interest. And then from there, I started to read a lot more books around the Black experience and not just focusing on the U.S. It was, you know, this global Black experience. And that's when I started to realize, like, wait, you know, uh, I I do have an origin story that's not based in America. You know, I started to uh, under learn about my parents. My parents are both immigrants from the Caribbean. My father's Jamaican. My mother's from St. Vincent. What did that mean? As a child, I didn't know. I just knew that they were from the Caribbean. And, you know, I knew about the, the cultural influences from the music and the food and the celebrations. And, you know, we were connected. I was connected with family. Even though my parents divorced when I was five years old, I was still connected to both sides of the family. And, you know, but then when I got into college, I realized I took my first African-American art history class. I was really interested in trying to learn more. So I made sure that even my classes that were around the, you know, you have those subjects where you have to take, <laughs> like art history. <laughs> well, I, I was I was so grateful that I had that option at that school. This was at SUNY Purchase in Purchase, New York. And that class is what really like opened my world to all these amazing artists that look like me. And it was because of that class I learned about Lois Milo Jones. And I didn't know anything about her before, but I we studied each artist. We studied their careers. Right. And she was a textile designer at one point before she I mean, before becoming known as this painter is what most people know her as. But she had a, a period of her life where she was designing fabrics. That was news to me. I had no idea that that even existed as a, a way of making. And so and then I learned about, you know, other artists and Monia Lewis Henry Osei Tanner, you know, Jacob Lawrence, all the well-known, you know, Black artists, especially during the Renaissance before and after, okay? And I am and I got an A in that class, and I was so excited to take tests. Like, I was like, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> you know, it was one of my favorites. But that's when I, I, and then all of my projects, when I was painting, when I was sculpting, I took, I took this information, not just from the African-American art history class, but I on my own was starting to read more about Black culture, but going back to the origins. So I, I really started to focus on Ghana, Senegal, Mali, Nigeria, you know, that part of the world where it's looking at the art, looking at textiles and looking at um, the wood carving, the pottery. I was looking at all of that and the fashion. Because culture is a way of life, right? It's not I, it's not isolated to one thing. So I wanted to investigate all of that, like how we were occupying space from a cultural perspective and knowing the history and the cultural traditions. Because again, as a person of the Black diaspora, those all were cut and the traditions have changed. And, but I also knew that we were not just practicing our traditions from nothing. There was a source and I wanted to know the source. And so as I continued um, with my art studies, I, I, I transferred to FIT from SUNY Purchase because at the time, this was the 90s, Benny, you know, it was no Instagram, no, no websites. I wanted to make money as an artist. And I thought, well, I, I need to get into something a little bit more commercial. And so I, I, that's why I transferred to FIT. Fashion Institute of Technology. I was very interested in drawing figures and fashion. And so I, I went and studied fashion illustration first. And I mean, I loved it. 
I mean, I was not the best in my class. It was clear that I was not going to, you know, get a job as a fashion illustrator. But I took it as an opportunity to learn about, you know, learn about the figure, learn about drawing, learn about color. But my professor, I'll never forget this professor, uh, Professor Ishikawa, she called us all by our last names. So so I was Barnett. So she, I remember one day she came up to me. She's like, Barnett, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do like with this? And this is, you know, like after an assignment, she's looking at my work. And I told her, now, mind you, uh, every program at FIT is two years. So you could get an associate and then you get your bachelor's. And I knew I had to get my bachelor's because that was like you, in my, my mother's eyes. You have to get your bachelor's. So. <laughs> so I was coming up to my two years and she said, when she, you know, she asked me that question and I said, um, I said, you know, I said, I'm going to go into textile design. And she said, Barnett, she goes, that's going to be the best thing for you. And I, and I said, it was just amazing. She was like, that's going to be your sense of color and the pattern. She knew, she knew I was not the best illustrator, <laughs> but I was, you know, I felt like I got her blessing to continue in a direction that would suit the way that I created. And she was right. And then when I, I did enroll in, in, in textile surface design, and that's when I realized, wow, you could design fabric, you could design dinnerware, you could design rugs, you know, bedding, wallpaper, all of these things that I never even considered as a way of making and using my art. And when I was given an assignment, I said, okay, we have all, I had all these classes now. So every assignment, I said, I'm going to use as an opportunity to learn about my culture. And so I would pick a different area to pick a different group of people. You know, I was designing stationery that reflected the end of the, the where they hand paint the, their houses with these bold graphic patterns and bold and bright colors. You know, I um, in 95, while I was in FIT, I, I made my first trip to Ghana. And I went on a cultural exchange because I always wanted to do a study abroad. I was like, I always wanted to do a study abroad, but the school had no countries that were Black, um, predominantly Black. And I wanted to be in that space. I didn't want to go to Europe at the time. So I created, I said, I'm going to find a program. I'm going to find a program that is going to fulfill my needs. And I did through the African Poetry Theater in Queens, they had a program called AfriQuest. And it was a, a three week a cultural exchange where I got to live with the family. And we had all these different uh, programs from learning the language. We, we participated in different cultural events, went to the museums. You know, we learned, learned about wood carving and learned pottery, like a Dinkra textile pa um, pattern making. So we learned about the culture through the art. And, you know, that experience, when I came back, Ben, my work changed again. I went deeper into my assignments with that experience where I, when it, I had a dinner, I'll never forget this one. I had a dinnerware assignment. And when I was in Ghana, they were celebrating the silver jubilee of the Ashantahini, um, one of the kings of Ashanti region. And it's, you know, it's a rare rare occasion to to get to that state. And I remember seeing how, you know, all the different, everybody came together in this large stadium and how, you know, how the different queen mothers and the Shanti were carried on this palanquin. And I said, you know, I'm going to design a dinnerware set for them. So that's how I was starting to think about my work from a cultural perspective. I was starting to make the objects or items that I, for a particular community or an experience. And then from there, it just continued to grow. I can't even imagine what it was like to celebrate the Silver Jubilee, like to be in a stadium full of people celebrating a cultural phenomenon. Because I think there, there is cultural cohesion there that's different than nationalism. You know, so like that yeah. area, because that that's Ghana, but also isn't the Asante area bigger than that? Oh yes, yes, it is, it is, it is, and that and that uh, that was the, the event took place in Kumasi, 
um, at the stadium. And every, you know, every time I go back and look at those pictures, but it's interesting because I remember I actually documented the stadium when it was empty and then more people came in and more people, it became like little dots, like everybody, because of the amount of people. And I was like, OMG, this is like, <laughs> I had never, you know, been in a space, you know, so big. And to your point, it was a culture. It wasn't a football game. It wasn't a base. You know, this was a celebration of the community and how everyone came. It was, you know, dressed in, in their best kente. And, you know, it was just, and, and the goal, it was just a, amazing to see. And, and also to know that this does not happen on a regular. So I got a chance to see that too. So it's like a, a moment in history that I was a part of. That if I wasn't thinking the way I was at the time, I would have missed it. So, so yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about when you leave FIT or, or when anyone leaves a design or a fashion institute, how do you actually get a job? Like, what do you do to then enter into the field of design? Well, it's interesting. I mean, FIT does have a very good uh, career center. Um, you know, they are well connected to the industry. So and that's funny. I used to work in that office as my, you know, one of my jobs was I was assistant to one of the um, the uh, employees there in the career center. So I, I, I understood how like the job board worked and everything. And but see, while I was in school, I, I didn't just go to school. I freelanced. I, you know, I had to work at times, you know, to to generate income. So I would freelance to do small jobs here and there. Some were creative, some were not. But I once I did graduate, there was a company where I freelanced for first. I made two patterns and it was an African print fabric company. It was my dream job. And, you know, I had been making all this work, you know, for the past few years focused on, you know, say African inspired pattern design. And so now I'm getting a job where this is what I could do. And so is it, so I, I did the assignment and they loved it. And then they were like, oh, well, we want to expand. And we're thinking, uh, you know, we'd like to talk to, talk to you about working for us, you know, full time. And my bold self, I said, okay, no problem. I said, well, I'm graduating, but I'll be traveling for the entire summer and you'll have to wait until I come back. <laughs> and they waited. <laughs> wow. What a flex as a yeah, like 20 they, year old or however old you were. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was, it was about 20, I think it was about 25 at the time because I, I was on a six year um, plan for school. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I, I w and that year I went to the Gambia I went to Ghana, went back to Ghana, and I went to India. So I was gone for the entire summer. And that was my graduation gift to myself. And so, of course, that experience, you know, I was able to immerse myself even more into the culture. I, at this time, I was studying Wolof. It's a language they speak in the Gambia and Senegal. And my teacher was from the Gambia. And so he said, when you graduate, just let me know. You could go stay with my family. And I did. And um, I was there for three weeks. And I went to Ghana. And uh, I stayed, was, you know, met with the people that I had uh, connected with the previous year. And then I went to India to my bestie's wedding. Um, we were classmates. And so that whole summer, you know, I had an amazing time of being immersed in culture, not knowing how that would affect my work, but it just kept on enhancing the experiences. Because for me, Ben, I'm very interested, not just reading about the different communities. I need to be with the community. And so it's really important that I, I interact personally, because again, as I said earlier, writers and journalists, they're artists too, and their words are their material. And they're gonna write in a way that reflects their artistry. So I want to go and see myself so then I could create my own words too. Um, and then, you know, document those experiences and share, because I feel it's really important to build those relationships. Yeah, and I think it's living research. You know, like, cause you can go to a library, you can get on the web, you can do whatever you want. But if you're in a community, it's just a whole different way of research. You get the subtlety of the community in a much different way. But how, as you transition, cause eventually you, you've had a big career. So we're just going to jump in and talk about different things. Sure. But I want to fast forward up to the part in which you're working with rugs and working with 
design that's going to go into large commercial spaces, which you, you mentioned before, you were having success, you were getting more notoriety, and you form uh, the Black Artist and Designers Guild. So can you talk about that part of your career being kind of a community builder around design? Yeah, um, well, I had spent 10 years like freelancing as a rug designer. Um, so I wanted to learn about the business. And one thing about me is that I we talk about how to get into the industry. One of the things I decided to focus on was the home because you could go in fashion or you could go on the home side. I focused on the home side because there's more longevity in the objects that you make versus fashion. There's a quicker turnover. So, and then I always was interested in how products were made. So I always worked with a manufacturer as a designer. So I would learn how it was made, how it was distributed and marketed. And so I wanted to know the full gamut of how to design, make, produce, distribute, and market a product. And so from there, um, after 10 years of freelancing, I started my own business, which was called Mulaney B. And I focused on custom handmade rugs. So now at this time, I'm working with artisans in Nepal, India, and China, and they're, I'm producing one, one of a kind custom rugs for hospitality, residential, and commercial spaces. And I would use my art again and my experiences of traveling around the world and incorporate those, um, those experiences into the designs. And so it was interesting because, you know, I was doing that for uh, about 10, about 10 years too, the, my own business. And there were many challenges because the work was not, it wasn't well received because I couldn't blend into what the ideas of what designers thought a rug should be, which was very simple and plain. And I was like, no, I want it to be graphic. I want to talk about the global world and, you know, color and, and three dimensional, like my work, my rugs were always three dimensional. So, and again, I, I had, I had successes, but I also had many challenges. Right. And so if we fast forward to like towards the end of where um, I was focusing on custom rugs, we're talking 2018 now. Right. So in 2017, I, I at the end of 2017, I exhibited at my last trade show, which was called Boutique Design New York, BDNY for short. Um, and again, I, I've, I've done a lot of trade shows up until this point. And so I was at the point, Ben, where I said, OK, I had a beautiful booth. I even won an award for my booth design. Um, you know, I had all these people come to the booth and I didn't have any sales after. And I said to myself, you know what? I was already at the point where I was just tired of interpreting my creativity through someone else. So I said, you know what? I got this big project. It was the Marriott at the time, uh, Moxie Marriott. And I, I did the rugs for the, the entire hotel. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a sabbatical from my business. And so I said, you know, I really want to, I want to do something else. I just knew that I could not continue this way as an artist because I knew I had a lot more to say and share. share. So, Ben, I got a, I believe in support, right? And I hired a, a business strategist, a consultant to like take a look at what I do, make an assessment. And the funny thing, the first thing she said, her name is Jasmine, by the way. First thing she said was, um, Melanie, you're an artist. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah, I know this. <laughs> she said, no, you're an artist. You need to go back to making art. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, but I said, wait. I said, no. I said, I, I, I asked for guidance, you know, and. I said, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to take this in and I'm going to I'm going to listen. And, you know, I called up my high school art teacher cuz she's still I uh, still connected with her. She lives in my hometown, friends with my mother. And I called her up and I was like, "Mary, I need help. I don't even I haven't been to the art store in years cuz I hadn't like I hadn't done quote unquote traditional painting cuz I was doing everything on the computer at this point." So she took me to the art store, Ben. It was so great. And, you know, then I was, I, I started with acrylic and then I used, I love pastel and charcoal. So I started, you know, getting, I got some of those materials and then I started painting and I, I would share on Instagram and tell my community, listen, I'm taking a break from the rugs. Don't be alarmed. I'm just, you know, exploring a different medium. Just, just follow me on this journey. And I have to share all this because, what that led me to was an opportunity to revisit 
my African American art history class and what I learned because I said at the, at that point I was like what artist was like I was really inspired by and you know and it was Edmonia Lewis Augusta Savage Lois Milo Jones Elizabeth Catlett right and I was interested in working in clay I said let me try a new medium right clay had always been on my mind never really took a dive into it. And so then I took a class, you know, the local class, like a lot of people. I didn't like it because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I actually I actually signed up for a slip casting class, not knowing <laughs> what that was. <laughs> but I was like, it's clay. <laughs> and it's funny because the, the teacher said to me, she goes, you know, I think you would like hand building better. And she was right. So I took another class. And that's when I was like, okay, hand building, yeah. So then hand building led me back to origin story of the diaspora. So I started to think, well, if hand building, how, what, how did we make pottery? Like as black people, like how do we make pottery? And so when I started to take a deeper dive and started to see how hand building was, was, was and still is the way that we were making pots, I said, OK, I'm going to focus on hand building. And I'm going to take a deeper dive. But then I was also interested in sculpting the figure. And going back to, say, Edmonia Lewis, I wanted to follow in her footsteps. Because I knew that she got ousted from college and she went to Italy. And she went to in Pietra Santa. So then I found a class in Pietra Santa, Italy. And I went there and I learned to, to do figure sculpting. And then I came back and then I got a residency at Greenwich House Pottery in New York City. And it was that opportunity that really solidified my feelings and thoughts around working in clay and staying in the medium. It was a beautiful moment because I was able to have four months to explore an idea. And the idea was around creating vessels that were looking at mud architecture in uh, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, uh, Mali, Ghana. And I was looking at the surface decoration of how these these buildings were made because it was the women who were making these patterns. So I wanted to build on that legacy and create vessels that are representative of that experience. And while I was in Greenwich House Pottery is the time when I started the Black Artists and Designers Guild. And so while I was on that residency, because remember I'm on sabbatical, so I'm not thinking about design. And now I'm outside of design intentionally, right? So I could see it from a different lens. I already knew, listen, it's like, you can't escape it. The racism, the sexism, the every-ism, it was always present, right? So it was just how I was navigating it and tolerating and how my friends and colleagues were too. It's just that we were not being very vocal about it. We just all were just trying to figure out like how we're going to be knowing we're dealing with all these social structures that are not allowing us to grow. And so when there was an event that happened um, in September of 2018, that's a prominent design event where there was no black artists or designers, part of the conversation, panelists, uh, moderators. I was at the point where I said, really? In 2018, we're still dealing with this? This is some BS pretty much. And so I, I decided to use, like my mother always taught me, Ben, use what you have. And I decided to voice my opinion on social media. And I made a post directing, directed at that event and, and the people behind it. Basically, how dare you? How dare you not have any Black talent? You're, you're in a, the, one of the most diverse cities in the country, and you can't tell me that you can't find any of us. So that's kind of the tone and, and how it started. And, you know, this is in September now, and everybody chimed in on this post from editors that I know, editors of magazines. Everybody was like, oh, my gosh, yes, Melanie. Oh, my gosh. We're... And then the ones who were like the editors, they were like, you know, you're right. We're complicit. We need to do better. Fine. Fast forward a few months later. Now, mind you, I've always had the idea around badge, which is Black Arts and Designers Guild for short. I always had the idea, Ben, because when I travel, I would always connect with local Black talent. And I would always have conversations. And I saw there was, I saw the similarities in our experiences, the challenges, everything. So I knew there was a lot of Black talent out there. It's just that, you know, we, people weren't paying attention to us. So I said, you know, I'll take it upon myself. I said, why not create a group, a directory where 
you know, nobody can make any excuses that we're not visible, we're not seen, we don't exist. All these, you know, I was thinking about all of that. And we come together and we create our own projects. We do our own work. It was, you know, not centering on the industry at all because they weren't interested in us anyway. So that's how it started. You know, I just reached out to friends. It started with like 30 people. And, you know, you know, I sent an email because I had no idea what it was going to become, what it was not. It was more about this is a directory so we could be seen. And then we could come together and collaborate and do different things based on whatever we choose. So 2018, November, we launched. I launched with an Instagram account and a website. And it was really simple. And then in 2019, you know, we had our first press opportunity in El Decor magazine. And then we started having our own talks. We, we, we exhibited in some trade shows, like art fair trade shows. And then we designed an exhibition. So there were, there were you know, simple things, simple in a way where it was focused on what we wanted and what we needed. And so, and then 2020 came and that's when everything changed. After George Floyd got murdered, Breonna Taylor, all of that, everyone started to come at us and we became like this hub for diversity, inclusion, and equity. And, you know, monies were thrown at us and we were able to build a bigger organization and, and of course, collaborate on bigger projects. And, you know, we collaborate with different brands and whatnot. But the thing is that that period has, of course, it is now gone silent. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we during that period, though, we, we did create some amazing projects. And one of them, which is our legacy project, is Obsidian. Obsidian is a virtual concept house where we were thinking about how do we create a home for the Black family? And what does that mean for us? It's not the nuclear family. You know, we think about the extended family. So this house was is an amazing um, online experience where we collaborated with 23 of um, the members, which are all makers, to create a space. So everybody had a different room. I actually personally designed a legacy wall where I was thinking about where in the home do we keep all of our records, all of the information about the legacy of our family from the from, from the pictures, from the health records. So it was all, all it was we had to incorporate technology, history, and and culture. And so um, and it's ceramic. It's a ceramic mural that it's like a it's a huge um, focal point in the home. And honestly, from that from that project started me to think about how do I bring that legacy wall to life and use clay as that tool. And so that's where I am now is the goal is like building more of these sculptural installations that really tell the legacy of the Black experience. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of over 4,000 objects made by over 1,000 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. So part of the sabbatical is that you also decided to go deeper into clay as a studio practice, but also to be a student again. And you go back to get an MFA at Tyler, which is interesting to me. Well, you took a sabbatical, but it also seems like you consciously just took a different path in life. Can you talk about having, we'll talk about the MFA, but can you just talk about having the confidence (laughs) that if you're not busy that people won't forget about you? Because I think a lot of times people don't take sabbaticals like this because they're afraid like, oh, if I stop working, no one's going to hire me anymore. So how did you get the confidence to just say, no, I'm going in a different direction here? I, you know, I think when it got to a point where if something is not serving me anymore, I need to let it go. And what I was doing wasn't serving me anymore because as I was saying, I knew I was an artist. I was an artist. I was a creator. I had so much more to share in my work and it wasn't being expressed. 
So, you know, you imagine when you have all, all these ideas and then everything is being, you, you know that this is not the community to support those ideas. And so I said to myself, you know, I'm almost, at the time I was uh, about 48, so I was getting to midlife, right? So, you, and I feel like, you know, I start to think about my life different. Like, do I wanna be doing this kind of work for the next 20 years? And the answer always was no. It's like, no, I don't wanna, I don't wanna continue to be the, the artist, designer, creator that is interpreting other people, other people's ideas. I do it very well and I could do it. That's not, that's not even the question, but is that what I want to do? Is that, is, is that, do I want that to be my legacy? And the answer was always no. It's a part of my legacy, but is that the core of who I am and what I do? And so for me, it was like, okay, I need to set up the channels to support this, this time off because you know, reality is you can't, I couldn't just jump ship and not do anything. I had to make sure that I was, uh, I had uh, the financial support to, to make it happen. And, I, and I'm a single woman. So, you know, I, I don't have anyone else that I'm relying on for income. It's all me. So I had to make sure that the channels were set so I could take the time off and then also know that, hey, maybe I have to scale back on certain things in my life. But I always knew that whatever I sacrificed then, it's only for the greater of myself for later. So the confidence, I think it's, it's something that has always been there for me. It's just that I wanted to make sure that, um, that I, was, I was prepared for this time off. And I did prepare myself. And so for me, then I wanted to, I always, my, my mother, she's, she's, she's an educator. She's retired for like 20 years now, actually 21 this year. And so education has been instilled in me since I was a child. And I believe in being in community with like-minded people. And I knew for me that I, want, I knew school was able to provide that for me. When I was in undergrad, you know, I had a nice community of people that I'm still friends with today, to this day. And so I wanted to build a new community around this new idea around clay. I, 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 I'm a student. I'm always a student. And I love to absorb the information from others. And I also love to share. And so I thought, you know what? A crazy idea for, for many. To, when I said, when I told people I'm going to go back to school. Because I wanted to make sure I had all the credentials. I didn't want to have any issues down the road. Oh, she doesn't have. Nope. <laughs> I want to make sure I have everything together. Because, you know, the reality is, Ben, you know, we're dealing with certain systemic ways of being that we cannot change right now. I know personally I'm not going to be able to change. So how do you navigate through it? And one of them is, you know what? I don't mind studying and I love studying, you know? And it's not going to hurt me to, to, to go get an M MFA. And plus, I want to be in community with others. I want to be challenged. I want to learn more. I want to have dedicated time just to work on my studio practice. Now, mind you, applying to a, a, a grad school, that it was not my first time. It was my third time. <laughs> it was my third time. And so when I finished um, Greenwich House Pottery, I applied to like, I think it was about seven schools at the time, five or seven schools. And they all said no. And they all said no. And I said, oh, okay, okay, no. <laughs> and was, there was only one school that was like, you know, they were interested, but they didn't have any more space. They only had one slot. And if you understand how grad school works, it's based on who's graduating. That's how many slots and, you know, the monies. It's usually not a lot of spaces. So I thought, well, if one school is interested, there's something there. So then I said, you know what? I'm going to get a studio. I'm going to go get a studio space and I'm going to make work so I can get into grad school. Now this is 20, now this is um, uh, 20, we're in 20, well, 2019 to 2020 now, right? So now I applied again for the third time. I think I, this, I, think I applied to about five or seven schools again, but some were, some were the same, some were different from the, from the first batch. Now I got five offers. So, so I was like, because I also knew once I had studio space and time, I was able to focus and create a body of work that had a story. And I knew that that was kind of lacking from the, 
from the first application. So I, I was not like, oh my gosh, I didn't get in. So no, it's another opportunity for me to review my work and see how I can improve on it. And so that, so the second, so the third time around, I got, I got in and then, then 2020 hit and we were in the pandemic. And so I was like, oh shoot, I don't even know if I'm gonna be going to grad school now because nobody knew what was happening. And, but luckily, you know, I was able to a, a start in the fall of 2020, um, moved to Philadelphia, had my own studio. Um, all classes were online, but as grad students, we had access to our studio and the building was empty. And I'll tell you, it was one of the best times of my life because it was quiet, didn't have any distractions. I didn't feel I missed anything because think about it, nothing was open. So what perfect opportunity, it was the perfect time to study because there was nothing else to do. So I felt like it was right on time, not even planning it, right? And so I excelled, I excelled in school. You know, I was really focused. I was really interested in experimenting. I wanted to use the opportunity to experiment. A lot of my work, it had clay, it didn't have clay, but that was how Tyler is you could experiment in different mediums and it really opened me up to different mediums from glass that I never worked in before I got into video moving image you know so there was other things that I was interested in now I'm like oh again there's going to be a time when I start to develop all of those interests um but the the focus was always about um handmade making pattern using my textile experience using my surface design experience to create objects around the black experience and so in in grad school i focused on my family i wanted to unravel the relationship i had with my caribbean roots it had always been like this romantic relationship you know i would go as a child go to the beach and you know eat the food, the parties, you know, that's what I knew. But now I wanted to understand how was this region created? And that's when um, my time at Tyler was spent taking a deeper dive. And one of the things that I started to focus on and, and question was, you know, who were the potters and what objects they were making during those colonial periods and before. And so I was interested in how culture how culture um, was transported and how we, there's what kind of cultural retention was there focusing on clay, but then uh, that idea always transcend into other areas of, of uh, my interest when it comes to around home. Because the concept, my, I guess I'm constantly, con constantly questioning and thinking about what is home and how does home look? How do we navigate home? And what are the objects that remind us of home? And, you know, how are things finished? So th those questions were constantly, um, I'm asking, I should say, I'm constantly asking those questions and then taking a deeper dive into different areas. I think a lot of clay people will know the ceramic tiles that you make that make the larger murals. So I, I hope people will continue to check those out. But I wanted to talk specifically about this series of portraits you made about your family where they're there it's a woven portrait so it has almost like strips of material that are woven together but there is a portrait of a person but there's also the image in the background they're it, they're beautiful there's so much happening in terms of foreground middle ground background can you talk about wanting to make that series and tying it to family legacy and family your family narrative but then also like how do you physically build those things like what what makes the images well it's interesting i i have i thought about a lot of my work too is about reimagining the archive right and so i don't first i never met my grandmother my maternal grandmother and my paternal because she died when my father was 5 so i had no grandparent experience my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, she migrated from St. Vincent to New York um, first. She left her children for about six years in St. Vincent with her mother. So there's that separation. And mind you, this is in the 50s, no, no cell phone, you know. And so I, I just wanted to know more about her because it's, I am in this country because of her, right? Because she took the leap of wanting to have find a better life for herself and her family. 
And so I learned about her through my mother and her and her and her my my aunties and her and my uncle, so her children. Um, and I only have a few pictures of her, and there's very few pictures of her. And so I was thinking about, well, how do I how do I continue to learn about her, honor her, celebrate her when we only have a few images, right? So there's this repetition that happens. And it's the same way of thinking when you think about pattern design, it's the repetition. And in that repetition is when we learn and connect. And so what I was doing was, my, and also my grandmother was a fashion designer. So, she, you know, so the, the creativity runs in the family. And, and so I was thinking about if she was alive, what would I be making for her? Right. I know if I, 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 if I had fabric patterns, she would be making dresses, right? She would be making clothes because that's what she did for herself and her children all the time. And so I wanted to use the idea of weaving, like weaving these experiences together, both literally and figuratively, and thinking about how um, I could weave the stories that I was told about her and through my and my mother's experiences, but then also thinking that I'm making this for her. So one of the portraits, um, one of the first ones in the series is called Made for Mom, right? So what I did was I've, I've taken two images, two separate images, a portrait of my grandmother, and then there's a portrait of my mother and her siblings and her granny. And they're all dressed in their school uniforms. And that picture was taken for their mother. They would get dressed in their school uniforms and they would mail that picture to their mom. And so, oh, and by the way, we called our grandmother mom. So that's why the piece is called Made for Mom, because that image was made for her. And so I wanted to, um, so what I did was I recolored the images to, to bring in more, because they're all black and white images, but I recolored them to have a more contemporary look and think about, again, I'm making this for her and I would add color and pattern and texture. And so I started to experiment with weaving and they're all made from paper, but I started to experiment with weaving in different different sizes, different constructions and stuff. And then I realized, you know, what I what I ended up with was the way to go because what happened is because of the coloration of the two images, it's one of those um, portraits where if you hold your camera up to it, you see the portrait clearly. But when you're in person, and there's no image, it, 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 you'll see, you, you're kind of, you're not sure, but the whole idea was that the children is who my grandmother left behind. And so they're, they're blurry in the image because that has been the experience. She never had, she never really had a long time to be with them as children, and she didn't have a long time to be with them as adults either. And the weaving is, is purposely not finished because her life was cut short. She had died in her 50s. And so she never really had the full experience of being a mother with her children. She was a mother, but just physically with the children. And so that's why I didn't I didn't complete the weaving because their their relationship was never fully, uh, it was never fairly materialized, I should say. So that's made for mom. And then I continue to build on that series. And I continue to use my grandmother as a focal focal image in the series. So she's all she always appears because this is how I'm learning about her. And so there's another piece that's called um, Mom Smile, Granny's Eyes. Now this this these are two portraits, one of my grandmother and this now she's at a different stage in her life. The first one made for mom, it was a picture taken in St. Vincent before she migrated. And so the second one, Mom Smile, Granny's Eyes, is a portrait of my grandmother she had already migrated here. She had been settled. You know, her kids were here at the at the time. And then a picture of my great grandmother, who we call Granny. And so they didn't have the 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 best relationship. They didn't have the best mother daughter relationship. And I wanted to dissect those experiences too. When you think about people who migrate, how it, it's really hard one to make that decision to leave your family, and then. On top of that, you don't really have close relationship with your mom because granny would, you know, critique and question all your your ideas, right? And but granny did take care of your children. So there is some connection. 
And so what I did was I, I, I wove it in a way where there's a conflicting um, image between the two portraits. You know, it's about, do you see, who do you see first? Mom's smile and the perception when you think about people who migrate and you see the smiling photos like, oh my God, everything is all great and wonderful. And my grandmother was one to dress to the T, you know, you know, it, it, so this, it's all these ideas of perception around person who migrates. And, that was a, and that's the conversation that I was trying to engage with that, that even though you may have family who are supporting your idea and your thought, it may not be the best relationship. And granny, she took care of her children, but then granny came to the U.S. and she didn't like it. So she, she ended up not staying long, you know, but. And then I added a, a, a embroidery on the piece because I thought about my grandmother who also did fine embroideries. When she came to work in the US, she was doing embroideries at a, a fashion house. And so I wanted to add that extra touch to that piece. And the series is ongoing. So I wanna continue to add more portraits, which is what I'm thinking about. And they're really large too. Like they're really large, six, five feet, uh, oh, by wow. yeah <laughs> I didn't really, realize that yeah 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 60 inches 64 inches wide I know mom's made for mom is 64 inches wide by about 90 inches long so they're pretty they're pretty big they're pretty big <laughs> what I like is that the visual metaphor of two people being bound together but still separate because I think that describes intergenerational relationships better than anything else. Like my father and I and my mother and I were close, but we are so separate. So that idea of the weaving, like to me, that's my family dynamic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's good. And, I, and see, I'm glad that you could see that because that's what I want people to start to think about their own too, their own families and the dynamics. So, and there's just a lot of stories and there's a lot of stories that are woven and stuck and that we don't even know what they are. And so again, using weaving as that metaphor to either to, to, to come closer together, but also to unravel as well. To wrap up, can you plug your website and then also the Design Guild, Designers Guild website? Sure, my website is Melanie Barnett. That's M-A-L-E-N-E-B-A-R-N-E-T-T.com. And the Black Artists and Designers Guild website is Bad Guild, B A D G U I L D dot info. Well, thanks so much, Melania. It was good to see you today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I could have talked all day. You know that. <laughs> I'm just getting started. <laughs> I'd like to thank Melanie for coming on the show. I was very appreciative that she was a guest host at this year's Inseka podcast room. So I did want to mention that if you would like to be a guest host, you can apply to be a part of next year's conference in Salt Lake City. The applications for that are due on May the 2nd, and essentially you get together a moderator and two or three participants on the panel, and then you pitch Inseka the idea. And then in the conference itself, I'll help you to produce that podcast live in front of an audience in our podcast room. Again, the deadline for that is May the 2nd, and you can find out more at Inseka.net. I also wanted to give a special thank you to our sponsors, including the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art and Bray Clay. If you or your organization would like to be a sponsor on one of our shows, you can get in touch at Brickyard Network. Dot or. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support.
This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.